Ladies and gentlemen, we have just witnessed history in the making. Australia won, Denmark nil, in an absolutely scintillating, fantastic game of football. <laughs> Socceroos fans that were fortunate enough to watch the 2006 World Cup in Germany will know where they were when Australia drew 2-2 to Croatia to make it into the knockout stages. Today, when Australia beat Denmark, people will remember the same thing. For years to come, Socceroos will think, where were you when Australia beat Denmark? What an incredible game for so many reasons. And again, I just want to highlight the historic nature of it. Never have Australia won two consecutive games in the World Cup. Think about that. 1-0 win against Tunisia, and then a 1-0 win against Denmark. Welcome back to Tea Time. This is a match review for the Australia-Denmark game, as you can obviously tell by what I've said so far in the thumbnail and title. What I want to stress here is that we are not just a Socceroos channel, of course. We know that we said we we're going to do a bunch of different match reviews, and the three so far have been for the Socceroos, um, but that's just because of the games that we take a particular interest in, because me and Aviv are obviously Australian. Anyway, into the game. There's four questions I want to highlight in this really short video, or four questions I want to answer. One, what does this result mean for Australia? Two, what does this result mean for Denmark? Three... Is this the way forward for Australia, the way they played? And four, are Denmark overrated? Let's start with what this means for Australia. As I said, it's a historic day. M massive in terms of the clean sheets, in terms of the win, in terms of getting into the knockout stages. Australia, every Australian fan can be very, very proud of that performance. And whilst there are things to improve, this is huge. It is very, very significant for Australian football. This will, I, I was actually hearing a very interesting thing. I think it was Harry Kuehl that was saying this. This win is going to be watched by 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds that are dreaming of playing at the World Cup, and it will inspire them to work that much harder. This is the g current generation's winning a uh, draw against Croatia and make it into the 2006 knockout stages. So it's huge for Australia. In terms of Denmark, I would not be worried. Um, Denmark looked really uninspiring in the tournament, only scoring, I think it was one goal. Um, let's see. I believe it was one goal for the Danes in this World Cup. Yes, one goal in a 2-1 loss to France. They looked uninspiring, failed to really make any attacking verve, and even though they dominated proceedings against Australia, they really didn't offer anything up front. There was one great block, I believe it was from Rouse, who uh, the ball spilled, I think it was to Braithwaite, who shot, and a great block from Rouse. But there wasn't much threat. But like I said, I wouldn't worry if I were Denmark. They've got a lineup of great young talent. Lindstrom from Frankfurt looks, he looked incredible. Skov Olsen is a good one for the future. They've also got Cornelius, Actually, I'm not sure if Cornelius is young, but they've got Dolberg, who used to be coined as one of the best young players in the world, but of course he's still got potential. They've got um, Barr, the right back, who came on. They've got a good a lot of good young potential, so I wouldn't be too worried with Denmark. And even if people were to say, okay, but this is Denmark's golden generation, all the main tournaments are increasing the amount of players, uh, the amount of teams. So instead of 32 teams in the next World Cup and in the Euros, it's going to be 48. So they're not going to worry. I don't, or maybe not 48 in the Euros, but 48 in the World Cup. So I don't think they should worry about not re-qualifying for the next one. Let's talk about, is this the way forward for Australia? Is this the way that the Socceroos should be playing in their round of 16 game against Argentina? It's interesting because Saudi Arabia played a very, very defensive but counter-attacking way against Argentina. They managed to score two goals from three shots and a very low XG. However, uh, Argentina seemed to be getting better and better as the tournament goes on, and I think Poland might have tried to play a little bit more of a defensive um, system that didn't really work with Argentina scoring two and Messi missing a penalty. Um, 
I think that Mitch Duke is the perfect striker for Australia right now, and he is honestly the centerpiece of how this system works. Maybe not the center, actually, maybe not the centerpiece, but Australia's core is very, very strong. The core of Suter and Rouse at center back, a double pivot of Moy and Irvine, and then Rouse up front, That's, that core is really, really important to the system. And I think that if we, if Australia continues to play long balls over to Mitch Duke, who will keep the ball and, um, by his body and play it to one of the central midfielders, I think that is the way forward for Australia. What will be interesting to see, though, is if Argentina can clock on that Australia seemed to press a little bit in the first 20 minutes. Surprisingly, Denmark didn't. Australia, in all three of the games, the first 20, 25 minutes, have not the biggest press, but there seems to be like a, a flick, a trigger that makes them press, and it works quite well. And Denmark didn't really um, notice it, and when they did, they didn't really make much end product when they were able to get out the press. But to answer the question, I do think that this is the way forward for Australia. I think Australian fans won't want that defensive football. But considering how solid that defence is looking right now with only four goals conceded against the world champions and two clean sheets in a row, I think that it is safe to say that it is conservative, but it is also efficient and effective. So I would, as an Australian fan, of course, I want to see better football, but I think that it's smart and it's tournament football, and that's how you win matches, and that's how Australia beat Denmark today. Playing a bit more conservative, on the break, hitting it long to Mitch Duke, he'll chest it down. Yeah, wonderful. And Matthew Leckie, of course, for his goal. We cannot, we haven't even spoken about him. He is pivotal. He is really, really pivotal. The trio of him, Mitch Duke, and Goodwin, whilst they do need to attack, offer something in the attack and on the counter... They're so important for this defense because they work so, so, so hard to lead the rest of the team. And Matthew Leckie especially, who sometimes looks like he's playing right center mid, right back, even DM at some points, and has to get all the way back to right wing so he can make runs. So very special mention to Matthew Leckie, who tied the record for most Australian games played in the World Cup, but scored his first goal in the World Cup, which is a great time to score his first goal. Last question. Were Denmark overrated? I don't know, to be completely honest. I think that a lot of a lot of people thought Denmark would top the group, and considering they came last, that would probably indicate that, yes, they were overrated. Maybe it's a case of France being underrated. A lot of people thought that the World Cup curse would occur again, and whilst they did lose to Tunisia in the closing game, they still managed to top the group, and the World Cup curse did not impact them whatsoever. Well, not too much. Denmark, I think, just seemed to have a lack of creativity in the midfield. It really seemed like Ericsson, the Ericsson show, and he has to try and create everything. And I think even though it worked for them in the previous Euros where they got to the semi-final, teams clocked onto that and they realized if you stop Ericsson, you stop Denmark. And that's what France, Tunisia, and Australia all did in the group games. I don't think Denmark were overrated because I think when... They're giving that given when Ericsson has that space to go and create, he's such a dangerous player. But I think that from a Danish point of view, this is a very, very, very disappointing tournament, considering Australia and Tunisia are two teams which you'd expect them to beat and even put up a good fight against France. So thank you guys very, very much for listening to this um, match review. Uh, I try to keep it really short. I know I waffle a little bit and I tend to just blabber. But um, I really enjoy doing this, and I know Viv does as well. Make sure you guys check out the next podcast, which is actually going to be filmed in about a couple hours. Um, it's going to be about the World Cup so far, which would be um, up until Group A, B, C, and D have concluded. Um, and I'm very, very excited for the rest of the World Cup. We're going to do match reviews, which aren't just Australia. Make sure you guys go to Instagram, tea time underscore underscore podcast. And make sure you like this video, subscribe. Thank you very much, guys. Don't go changing.